This video is about my little adventure in getting into 3D printing by way of building the Prusa i3 Mark III S Plus 3D printer kit and then doing the uh, initial tests and calibration and finally printing my first 3D printed object. I actually made two orders. First the printer kit itself and here's the box it came in as well as another steel printing sheet or hotbed sheet. This is the textured version. The kit by itself comes with a smooth uh, surface version. And there's a view of the textured one. Some documents came with the kit. One is just a sheet of various uh, URLs to get various kinds of assistance and information upgrades. And then the two excellent hard copy, quality printed assembly and use manuals, and then some statistics from testing the, uh, the hot extruder. So a quick rundown of what's in the box. There are several cartons within the box. One of them is for the power supply unit. And there's the parts for the x-axis, which is mostly framework or the y-axis, that's the framework. A big roll of uh, Prusa filament, a bag of gummy bears, the uh, fasteners and electrical cables, also internally broken down, a set of the various uh, larger 3D printed parts, orange and black, a kit with all the motors. These are stepper motors. There are five in total. And then the uh, parts for the hotbed, including the smooth sheet and the uh, framework. Also in the box are a tube of the steel rods that are used for the three axis and some sleeving. There's a blurb about uh, making sure that you use the correct documentation, a description of the tools that are included with the kit, and these are basically all you need to use. There's a little blurb about uh, how to identify the parts. There's a cheat sheet with all the hardware described in scale. And there's also a spare parts bag. And, of course, a description on how to use the gummy bears. The assembly manuals chapter 2 begins the actual assembly with the y-axis assembly. On this printer the y-axis is the front and rear motion of the hotbed or printing table. In this step the printer's frame is put together. This includes the big picture frame shaped steel, uh, powder coated steel frame uh, that goes vertically in this photo and then the uh, horizontal frame which is made out of aluminum extrusions and either aluminum or steel plates at the front and rear along with of course the, um, the various slider rods and bearings. Here are the main parts for the frame and uh, here are the screws that are needed. The long extrusions go on here or I think yeah the long extrusions those are towards the front and they just screw in like that. And then the uh, short extrusions go on the rear and spaced a little further apart. And then the end plates go on. Here I ran into my first problem. Three of the screws that I put in seemed to be going in okay, although maybe a little stiffer than the other ones. And then I decided that I wasn't happy the way, with the way they were going in, so I tried backing them out and they refused to budge. I had to use a pliers on the screw heads to wrench them out and uh, I found that the threads were uh, somewhat boogered up inside the aluminum extrusion and uh, in my experience this can be happen this can be caused by the uh, factory tapping of the extrusions not being done correctly or maybe too shallowly or perhaps a tap was broken when it was doing the holes it has seemed to affect all four holes at the end of that one extrusion. 
this problem did not exist on any of the other extrusions or the other end of the same extrusion. So I ended up buying um, four equivalent screws at the local hardware store and just using those, although Prusa did happily expedite a shipment of replacement screws to me. I just put them in the spare parts bag. I also had to buy a new metric tap uh, in the size of these screws so I could re-tap the holes in the end of that extrusion to make sure they were clear and deep enough so I wouldn't have a problem. And then the uh, new screws went into those holes just fine. On the right rear frame extrusion, uh, two metal uh, so-called power supply unit or PSU holders are inserted into one of the channels for uh, use later on when mounting the power supply to the frame. And here's the uh, assembled frame. At this point the screws are slightly tightened but not fully tightened. At this point it's critical to get the frame trued up and uh, although it can tolerate a small amount of frame misalignment or out of true, uh, the software can compensate for a little bit, but for best results you really want to get the frame as absolutely square and true as possible, and this is stressed in the manual. Uh, I knew that my workbench was pretty flat, but only as flat as a piece of plywood with masonite on top can give you. I was hoping for better. I thought I would use the top of my table saw since it's a large cast iron machine surface, but uh, when testing it with a long straight edge I found out that it wasn't all that flat after all. It had a bit of a twist to it. So I hunted around in my shop for something else that was large enough that was flat, and it turned out the top of my um, router table uh, once the fence was removed from it was big enough to lay the entire uh, 3D printer frame on and I verified its flatness first by laying a long straight edge, a steel straight edge, uh, along the top in various orientations, different angles and so on, verify there was no uh, visible gap under it so that satisfied me that the table was true. Then I rested the printer frame on it, loosened all the screws into the frame and extrusions, held the printer frame down flat to the table firmly and then following the instructions in the manual gradually tightened up all the uh, frame screws going with a diagonal pattern until they were all nice and snug and the printer frame still wouldn't wobble at all on the uh, router table. There are four anti-vibration feet that are inserted into the frame at this point and then slid to a position about three centimeters from the ends. An idler bearing and a bracket and some hardware are used to uh, assemble and mount to the front end of the frame. For the y-axis motor it's bolted onto its mounting bracket which is then mounted to the rear frame using a few bolts and nuts. The y-axis carriage is this heavy x-shaped part onto which the heat table mounts and it's uh, carried on three roller bearings which are linear bearings. Each linear bearing rests into a cutout in the carriage and aligned so that its four rows of small balls are uh, positioned at 45 degree angles from straight up and down or left and right and then the bearing is held in position with a bearing clip which is in turn held to the carriage with nuts and bolts and then uh, the other two bearings are similarly mounted to the carriage. Two long smooth rods are used to pass through the bearings and uh, these are the medium size rods out of the six provided and they're carefully slid through the bearings and then a set of um, rod holders have little nuts pressed into them which then uh, are used to affix the rod holders to the ends of the frame.
These slides show the process of putting the rod holders into the frame. It's sort of slid into position and then uh, with the rod holders up against the front and rear frames, a couple of screws are put into each one end to end. An extra screw on each rod holder is used to clamp the rod firmly into the holder and then the uh, carriage is slid forwards and backwards listening to see if the noise changes or if it binds in any position. So this is all pretty smooth here. When I get to the front it makes a different noise. This is a different noise here. Here it gets a little sticky just to have to push a little harder then it moves. This is about perhaps uh, three centimeters. I go back three centimeters then it moves smoothly. Just a little sticky right up in here. Very high pitch sound, very smooth sounding. A little rougher. Much rougher at the end. I've wiped the rods, they seem to be clean. I have adjusted these by loosening these screws. It makes no difference. I've even tried um, loosening these and seeing if there's any adjustment this way or this way between these but there seems to be no uh, looseness there so I don't understand why it's catching here probably the motor can overcome this but uh, I'm worried about what's going on here since the bearings move smoothly here I think the bearings are okay it's almost as if the rods are too far apart or too close together at this end so the bearings uh, uh, have more side loading on them perhaps. That's what it seems like, but I cannot adjust this any more than it currently is. Okay, I have removed the screws here and here and also here and here. Now it moves with the same noise and no sticking. Okay, I have temporarily removed the Y carriage from the frame and I noticed that this rod with the single bearing feels much rougher. Maybe that's because there's only one bearing where by contrast this one moves very smoothly but this one always feels a little grindy and if I put even a slight load this way or this way it gets very rough. So maybe there's a problem with this bearing, I don't know. Um, anyway, it's a problem, I think. It turned out that there were actually two problems. One is that these linear bearings, uh, even though they look very firm and solid on the outside. It's actually a pretty thin shell and uh, the bearing clips can actually be mounted down so tightly on the carriage that it squashes and slightly deforms them uh, and I had them too tight. Uh, and the other problem was that uh, the alignment wasn't as good as I thought it should be and I really just needed to repeat the rod alignment or rod and bearing alignment procedure 
which again helped and they pointed out that just due to small imperfections in the way the rods are held into their mounts at the ends tightening down on the clamp screws too much can actually slightly skew the rods near their ends and cause that problem so I backed off on those screws just a little bit and then it worked much better but I don't have a separate video showing that. The Y motor pulley is put on at this stage there are two set screws and the position is set later. The Y axis belt is put on next the belt itself is just a length it's not uh, provided in a loop and then there is a, a belt holder which is a 3D printed part. The one end of the belt gets anchored to that. And then the other one is the belt tensioner, which is very similar, but instead of having a round hole for mounting it to the, the chassis, it has a slotted hole. And then a long bolt passes between the two to provide uh, tension by sliding the, uh, the tensioner uh, forwards or backwards. A couple of nuts are pressed into the holder and then the belt at one end is wrapped around a bolt which is threaded into the holder and secure that way as can be seen here. Then that is bolted to the chassis. Then the belt is run through the motor pulley and then to the other end of the frame around the idler and then here's the uh, belt tensioner and using the same technique as the other end, it's looped around a bolt and fit in there. And there's the bolt in the slotted hole. It's put onto the chassis. And then uh, the belt is adjusted for tension. Here the bolt between the two holders is not there yet, and here it's been put in. And uh, you can see the bolt right in the middle of the picture between the two holders providing the tension. So here is a, uh, a front view and a rear view, or with the carriage to the front and to the rear. The instructions now allow consumption of 15% of the included gummy bearers. The next subassembly is the Y axis. This is the part that allows the print head or the extruder head to move sideways, and that's what's called the X axis in this situation. There's a mounting bracket for the motor at one end and a mounting bracket for the idler at the other end and then four linear bearings and an idler pulley and uh, some nuts and bolts. Each of these two plastic brackets uh, gets two linear bearings put into it and you can see from this photo that just as if the, with the uh, two bearings on the uh, carriage for the y-axis it's important to put one bearing in rotated 45 degrees from the other one so the bearing in the back in this photo has its bearing races kind of like the points of an X and the bearing that's towards the front in this photo its bearing races are aligned more like the points in a plus symbol and that's important to get the proper loading in all uh, directions that the shaft can press on the inside of the bearing. The two bearings are positioned at the ends of their plastic bracket with a bit of a gap between them. And then some nuts are pressed into the plastic pieces and here's a tensioning bolt for the uh, x-axis motor uh, and with that installed. And here the x-axis belt idler is bolted into the other bracket. The two longest rods of those provided are used here, along with three linear bearings. Two bearings go on one rod, one on the other. It's the top rod that gets the two bearings. Those are inserted into the two plastic brackets. And then the X-axis motor is selected, and its uh, pulley is put on. Once again, it has two set screws. The fine positioning of this will happen later and then three bolts are used to mount the motor to its bracket. And there is what you end up with there. 
The x-axis assembly was easier than the y-axis, so the manual only allowed for eating 10% of the gummy bears, although I didn't take a picture of that. Now for the z-axis assembly. The uh, z-axis regards uh, moving up and down on the frame. The z-axis has two stepper motors, one for the left and one for the right, and each has their own bracket. The brackets are uh, similar but not identical. They're mirror images of each other, and each has three mounting bolts that's used to mount it to the frame. The two z-axis motors uh, are identical except for the length of their cables, and you have to make sure you put the correct ones on the left and right sides of the frame. The z-axis motors, instead of having short shafts onto which go uh, pulleys, instead they have long threaded shafts coming from them, just like shown in these pictures, a long helical screw. Each of the motor shafts has threaded onto it from the factory a so-called trapezoidal nut, which are these two black uh, nuts that are shown above the screws, and those need to be unthreaded from the shafts and set aside at this time. The two motors are bolted to their brackets. A pair of 3D printed so-called Z-screw covers are screwed onto the, the two motor shafts and threaded all the way down to almost touching the motors but not quite. And you can see them here, they're kind of uh, uh, conical shaped pieces with a rough texture. I think those are just really dust covers to keep debris and such out of the motor bearings that might otherwise fall onto them. That's my guess it's not really explained in the manual. Two nuts are pressed into the end brackets. Uh, two nuts per bracket as shown here. One of the trapezoidal nuts, one per uh, bracket and motor, is now assembled to the brackets and mounted with a couple of screws into the nuts that were installed in the previous step. And it's important they be mounted with the reduced diameter side facing down and inserted into the bracket. The two remaining rods are now used for this access. The z-axis assembly is held over the frame and lowered carefully onto the two threaded rods. Then the two rods are twisted by hand to lower the assembly down an inch or so onto the rods. It's recommended at this point to try to get the assembly parallel to the top frame. And to do that I just stuck a bubble level under the bottom edge of the frame and under the uh, top z-axis rod and held it up against them and then checked to see that it was level there, meaning that those two were at the same height, and then moved the bubble level to the other end and did the same test and adjustment. Then the two remaining rods are slipped through their bearings and down into the uh, motor brackets. To secure these rods and the tops of the threaded rods from the motors, there are two top brackets which get placed down over them and then secured to the top frame using a pair of uh, bolts and nuts each. Because the z-axis was an easy step, only 10% uh, of the gummy bears are allocated as a reward at this time. Up next is the so-called e-axis which is the axis of moving the filament up and down respective to the part being printed and E stands for extruder. This is the most complicated assembly so it's a good thing they've saved it till this point in time. I start with the main extruder body piece, a large complicated uh, 3D printed part and it has a pair of neodymium magnets in bar form and a couple of smaller plastic parts and some nuts, bolts, and a large ball bearing. Two uh, square nuts 
and two hexagonal nuts and one of the screws or bolts are pre-assembled to this plastic part at this time. The filament sensor lever is a plastic piece and the smaller neodymium magnet which gets pressed into a slot in the lever and then a bolt put through it and then this is in turn screwed into the main assembly uh, so that it can move freely from right to left and back and forth. The magnet in the filament sensor lever works against the larger neodymium magnet which is affixed to the frame and I have it temporarily just stuck in a little bit here uh, to see which way it reacts. In one way it opposes the magnet in the lever, in the other orientation it attracts the magnet in the lever. As the instructions are at pains to stress, when the large magnet causes the filament sensor lever, lever to uh, be attracted, in other words move to the left, that is bad and you really want to have it oriented such that it opposes or repels the uh, magnet in the filament sensor lever. Only when this has been firmly established and the magnet orientation is correct can the large magnet be pressed down as far as it goes into the assembly. Still a large part of it will stick up out of the assembly. The ball bearing is then inserted into the socket in the small plastic adapter and made sure that it can spin around freely in there and then that is slotted into the main assembly and pressed down until it's flush with the top surface. Alright, the way this works is, I believe, the filament comes down into the top of the assembly and through the ball bearing adapter uh, where it runs to the right of the ball bearing as it's shown in this photo and then pushes the ball bearing out of its socket a little bit and therefore against the um, filament sensor lever pushing it to the left although the magnetic force is trying to push it to the right so it's kind of like having a spring in there and uh, by that method it's able to tell by the motion of the filament sensor lever whether or not there's any filament passing into the extruder assembly. Pictured here is the extruder motor and the extruder motor plate as well as a couple parts I'll talk about later but in the next couple of steps it'll be the motor mounted to the extruder motor plate not to the e-axis main assembly. The filament is fed into and out of the extruder by being pinched between a pair of specialized rollers that have knurled channels in them uh, one roller grabs one half of the width of the filament and the other roller, uh, the opposing roller, is held against the first one by spring tension and grips the, uh, the other side of the filament. So at this point we're going to put one of those special rollers uh, which is called a Bond Tech roller. I think that may be the brand name of the company that makes it. Uh, that goes onto the E-axis motor shaft. The instructions stress at this point that uh, there are two Bond Tech uh, gears furnished with the kit and only one of them has a hole or holes for set screws. And you can see here that the Bond Tech gear with the set screw is the one that's mounted onto the motor and you can also see the knurled channel towards the left of that screw, just left of the set screw. To align the Bond Tech gear to the motor shaft, we tap into the large roll of silver filament that's included with the kit. I'm not sure it's always silver, it was with my kit. And we just cut off a little piece of it, several inches, as shown in this picture. The uh, gear is moved up and down on the motor shaft to best align with the filament when it's laying in its channel and then the set screw is tightened. The instructions also mention that um, one of the included Allen wrenches 
has approximately the same uh, cross-sectional diameter as the filament and that can be used instead of the piece of filament for this alignment purpose. The printed part called the extruder cover is prepared at this stage by inserting one of the square nuts into the recess. Next we're going to use some of the so-called hot end parts which come all in one box to keep them together and uh, the hot end itself is shown here. The two large diameter wires are for the heating element that makes the hot end hot and the two small wires are for a thermistor that's embedded in the assembly so that the computer on the printer can monitor and thus control the temperature of the uh, hot end itself. The hot end is placed into the uh, hot end assembly and then the extruder motor plate with the motor is put on top of that and uh, the two are bolted together. The previously prepared extruder cover is now placed over the other half of the finned part of the hot end. Now for some preliminary assembly of the so-called X carriage, uh, which is really just the part that the x-axis belt mounts into and you can kind of see some of the recesses in the part for that purpose. Some square nuts are assembled into this uh, part at this time. The so-called IR sensor cable is slipped into a channel on the uh, assembly, the x-axis carriage, and I should note at this point that the sensor isn't really looking at infrared, not like it's scanning for some infrared source. It's really just there to detect the position of the filament sensor lever, whether it's one way or the other. And that's because uh, this little sensor that'll get plugged into this cable, although it uses infrared, it has both a transmitter and a receiver on it and it shines the infrared beam from one side to the other and that when it's mounted in properly in the overall assembly the position of the filament sensor lever uh, moves through the, a gap between the transmitter and the receiver of the infrared light source and that's how that all fits together. The cable from the E-axis motor or the extruder motor is now fed through a channel in the uh, X carriage part. The infrared sensor is now taken out of its anti-static bag and um, one of the screws here is going to be used to mount it. It slips sensor side down into a hole in the overall assembly and is secured with that one bolt. And then the end of the IR cable is plugged into the sensor. All of the bolts that pass through this assembly to hold it together are now tightened up to make sure there's no gaps. The hot end fan, which is the small fan that keeps the hot end from overheating, is now bolted to the assembly. The extruder idler is prepared next. There's the extruder idler cover, the other uh, Bond Tech gear, some ball bearings, a small shaft it all gets pressed together the bearing or the gear gets mounted in and uh, like this the extruder idler is almost like a little door or a hatch and it goes in position and a bolt is passed through to act as a hinge and now it's closed over the other bond tech gear the cover for the filament sensor is now prepared and it just gets placed over the, fil the uh, infrared sensor and held down with a bolt. The extruder idler is now going to be pre-tensioned. A long bolt passes through a coil spring from one side and then threads into the uh, pressed in nut on the extruder idler itself and then the uh, bolt is tightened up against the spring to put tension on that uh, idler door to keep it so the two Bontech gears are pressed together. The second fan on the printer is the so-called print fan 
and its job is to blow air down right on top of the piece that's being printed just below the hot nozzle so that as soon as the molten filament is deposited by the extruder and the hot um, the hot nozzle that it is immediately cooled by this blast of cooler air so it doesn't remain molten any longer than it needs to so we're now going to be setting things up so we can mount this fan to the the e-axis assembly. The print fan support assembly is just one part that's bolted to the overall assembly like this. The fan shroud is another part. This helps direct the air from the fan to where it needs to go and that's mounted right as shown in this photo here. The fan is then slipped into position on the shroud and tipped back against its support uh, bracket that was put on in the previous step and then aligned uh, with a bracket that's already on the extruder assembly as shown here and then uh, two bolts are put through to hold it in position. The print fan's wires are then routed back through a channel on the x-axis part. Up next is the so-called Super Pinda sensor. Uh, the Pinda is P-I-N-D-A, and that's a Prusa exclusive marketing term, I guess. Um, I think it's just an off-the-shelf sensor by one of the German manufacturers. I forget which one, but I recognize the name when I saw it. And uh, it's basically an inductive proximity sensor and so it senses how close uh, metal is to the tip of the sensor and it's used by Prusa on this printer to detect when the extruder assembly is at a certain distance from the steel hot plate or the steel printing plate. Uh, and PINDA supposedly stands for Prusa Induction Auto Leveling so Super Pinda is the super version of that. According to the knowledge base, they started out with just a Pinda version 1, and there were some issues because as things heated up around the uh, the E-axis, or the, yeah, the E-axis hot uh, assembly, it changed the values of components inside the sensor, and therefore it would start reading the proximity of metal at a different distance than it should have been. So the version 2, uh, Pinda version 2 came out and that was used up through the Mark 3S printer and that included a built-in uh, thermistor to compensate for the difference between cold and hot measurements. Uh, and then the Super Pinda does away with the thermistor by using just a higher quality sensor in the first place that uh, is designed for a wider range of temperatures from the get-go and therefore doesn't really need that stuff. So the printer I have uses the Super Pinda. The Pinda sensor is slipped into its adjustable holder and its cable has a loop formed in it. Two wire ties are selected and passed through holes and channels already uh, part of the 3D printed X chassis. On the X axis assembly the bearings are slid into a centered position as shown and although I didn't mention it earlier um, before the bearings are slid onto the shafts they're all marked with a sharpie marker uh, to show the orientation of the internal uh, ball bearing races and here they're uh, positioned uh, according to the marks being oriented as shown. The E-axis assembly is placed up against the bearings and the two wire ties are looped around the top bearings tightened and the excess cut off. All of the E-axis internal wiring is laced over the lower rod at this point. And this is the x-axis belt. It's very much like the y-axis belt we looked at earlier. Unlike the y-axis belt with its holders and the belt being looped around bolts, 
in this case with the uh, x-axis belt, it just sticks into these curved channels in the x-axis uh, carriage plate as shown in this picture. And that part is 3D printed to have uh, bumps in it that match the teeth on the belt so it locks into position. The belt is passed through the uh, idler on the right side carriage assembly, goes back through the slot or channel in the x-axis assembly, and then around the motor on the left side, around its pulley, and goes back, and then returns to the x-axis assembly where the end of the belt is laced into its corresponding anchorage and trimmed of excess length. The screw previously shown on the motor bracket now allows for the motor to be slid sideways on its uh, slotted uh, mounting screw holes until the belt has a nice tension. The little bit of excess belt is just cut off and discarded. Many 3D printers can also print using a variety of filament types uh, such as ABS or PLA and many can also use nylon and some other more exotic filaments. Uh, the kit includes a length of nylon filament um, and I think it's about uh, 20 inches long or 50 centimeters and this is used as a stiffener for the cable bundle uh, coming from the um, the e-axis head uh, so the first thing we have to do is mount this. The filament is cut at roughly a 45 degree angle so it has a point. On the rear of the X carriage is a small hole just above the lower bearing and the nylon filament is stuck in as far as it will go and then twisted clockwise which locks it in place. The large and varied bundle of wires coming out the back of the X uh, carriage uh, requires a lot of strain relief and so there are two parts here. There's the X carriage back plate uh, that's on the left here and then the cable holder. A long bolt passes through the cable holder and then it threads into a nut which is pressed into the X carriage back and then tightened down a U-shaped channel in the cable holder aligns with a hole in the back of the uh, X carriage back. The various wires and cables are fed through the hole and to the cable holder. Four bolts are used to pass through the X carriage back and then into nuts which are already embedded in the um, E-axis assembly. Five wire ties are selected and uh, a length of nylon mesh textile uh, that's spiral wrapped around the cables and then anchored to the cable holder with three wire ties tensioned and cut off. And then the hot end wires pass under the cable holder and are secured to it with two more wire ties. And then in what I found to be an arduous and awkward task that I just hated doing, I need to slowly unwrap that uh, textile sleeve which wants to spiral into a tight uh, overlapping corkscrew and get all the wires, including the hot end wires, inside of it. And its natural spring tension tends to hold the uh, the internal wires bundled tightly together. And I should mention here that along with all the wires and cables that nylon filament is also inside of this whole bundle. This was the single most time-consuming step with a lot of places to go wrong and you really have to watch the instructions carefully and take your time on this step. I'm glad that I did because it worked out. Because of how arduous this last step was, the manual now rewards us with 20% of the gummy bears. 
The next major step is the so-called LCD assembly, which I think is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, it's really the control panel, which includes a, um, a beta control, a knob, a push button, an LCD, and a circuit board. It's not just an LCD, but that's the way Prusa has chosen to name it. Anyway, so let's get into that. There's the LCD circuit board module, the front panel case and some brackets on the knob, and uh, some screws. The two cables are identified with one and two black stripes. These two brackets get slid on, and there's the front side of that. And then it snaps into the, the main housing using this little tab to snap it in. And then the uh, two brackets are aligned automatically by these little curved pieces on the assembly. There's what it looks like on the front. It has a little bit of protective film over the LCD itself. And uh, now that's ready to mount to the frame. Two square nuts are pressed into each of the brackets. And then uh, four bolts are pushed through the front frame from the rear protruding out the front like this and then those are threaded into the nuts from the previous step and there it is. The only thing remaining to be done is to push on the little five uh, pedaled uh, beta knob. At this point, the included SD card can be inserted to make sure it fits. The included uh, SD card includes kind of a library of utilities and uh, tools and so on, as well as the G-codes uh, for several uh, test and demonstration objects that can be printed. And although the main electronics module, the controller of the whole printer, can even interface with things like a Raspberry Pi computer, uh, and it has a USB uh, capability, which is primarily uh, intended, so I've read, to change the firmware on the controller circuit board uh, by plugging it into a personal computer. Uh, as far as getting the G-codes for objects you want to print into this printer, the primary way of doing that is to load them onto an SD card and then plug that into this slot select them with the menu on the LCD and then print them. Okay, with the LCD control panel mounted and we just tuck the wires out of the way for the moment, they'll be connected later. It's time to move on to the next major step which is mounting of the heat bed and the power supply unit assembly. Um, the manual did reward us with 10% uh, of the gummy bears from this last step but I didn't take a picture of it. The heat bed is a thick, it looks like it's made out of fiberglass with an embedded heating element and also many embedded neodymium magnets which attaches the uh, steel print sheets. And there's also a um, thermistor uh, taped onto the back of it to monitor its temperature. The pre-made power cable for the heat bed is selected and bolted to the large pads with uh, bolts and nuts and uh, then they're tilted so their insulators are touching and then there's another one of these pre-cut nylon uh, reinforcing bands and a housing which goes on like this from the uh, top and then bolted with a single bolt and this is the way it looks from the other side. Then the thermistor wire is fed through it and put into the nylon sleeve 
and then finally the rest of the housing is bolted on. It looks about like this. Now the heat bed will be mounted to the chassis using uh, nine spacers and bolts. The chassis has tapped holes in it. The spacers are put above, starting with the middle one, and then a bolt goes through the heat bed, through the spacer, into the threaded hole in the chassis, and then the other eight are done likewise. The power supply unit, two pre-made power cables, and a so-called power panic cable are here, and then you mount the power supply to the two lugs in the extrusion that were done previously, slip its uh, channels down over those bolts, and then align with the frame, slide it towards the frame, put two more bolts through the frame into the side of the power supply, and it's mounted. The power cables are screwed onto the power supply terminals. They kind of overlap like this because the left two are positive, the right two are negative. One of the cables provides power for the heat bed, and the other one provides power for the hot end. And it's good practice to give them their own feeds directly from the power supply. And then the power panic cable plugs into a socket on the power supply unit. There's the uh, brand name and model of the power supply, and we're rewarded with some more gummy bears. The so-called electronics assembly step. This is a fairly complicated step. caused me to take quite a bit of time to do it and make sure I was doing it correctly. And there are tons and tons of cautions in the manual about making sure you're doing it right and double and triple checking. You can blow things up pretty badly if you get any of this wrong. But the electronics assembly is really just the so-called INC board, which is an integrated uh, power controller that controls the power to the hot end and the heat bed. It includes a microprocessor. It has all the control circuits for all the stepper motors, so it's a stepper motor driver. It has interface signals for the various sensors. Uh, it has the drive circuitry for the two fans. Really, this is the brains and the heart of the 3D printer. So it almost seems like it needs a more grandiose title than just electronics assembly. The door to the electronics assembly enclosure is called the Einzy door, and that's spelled, by the way, E-I-N-S-Y. Don't know what it stands for, or if it's some name or something. Maybe it's a cute title. Anyway, uh, there are two little 3D printed hinges, one for the bottom of the door, one for the top. Each one attaches with a single bolt into its own threaded hole in the printer's frame. Also, another square nut is pressed into a hole in the door, and I think this is for holding the door shut later on. A wire tie and another one of those accursed spiral-wrapped nylon web tubes or sleeves are uh, made ready. The tube is slipped over the x-axis motor cable, slid right up to the motor, and secured there with a wire tie. Another 3D printed part is the so-called Einzy base. This is what the Einzy board is mounted into. Four nuts are pressed into the plastic, and that's to mount the circuit board later. Then square nuts are pressed into additional recesses at various key points on the Einzy base. And then the INC circuit board is mounted to the INC base using four bolts. Two screws are slightly threaded into two tapped holes in the frame, made ready to receive the INC base. And then the cable from the X motor is plugged in and routed like this through a hole in the INC base. And then the INC base is screwed to the uh, frame. You have to use a an Allen wrench at an angle, but it works. And that's the way the uh, X motor uh, cable comes in. Wire and cable management. Starting at one end, the cables are brought together and lashed to the frame with wire ties. Add in a motor, 
tuck the flat cables from the LCD through the extrusion, bring it out next to the cable bundle, bring it in with the cable bundle, add it to the wire tie, and here's the uh, extruder uh, wire uh, reinforcing parts, bringing it into the INC base. The cable from the heat bed is brought in and wired up as shown. And then the other motor wires are lashed around. A uh, protection cover is put over the power supply terminals. And back to the INC base, it's all just bringing wires in, plugging them in, trying to route them neatly. Uh, you have to be very careful because none of the connectors are marked in any way that you can see and the diagrams in the manual aren't that good. Two more wire ties are lashed through. This particular plug here is the one from the um, the uh, proximity sensor and that was not at all clear in the manual and I had to really study hard to figure out which set of pins in that connector it plugged into. After some digging I found a better diagram for the INC board, downloaded it, printed it out, and used that for the connections. The IR sensor cable is plugged in, the print fan cable, the hot end thermistor, and the uh, super pinned uh, cables in there, the hotbed heater cable, and you have to somehow wrap up this rat's nest in a way that you can get the uh, cover closed. But it did all fit. One long bolt goes through and holds the uh, cover closed. Ta-da! Assembly is basically completed. There's the rear and there's a front view. The double spool holder comes in three pieces. The uh, two sides just snap into the middle part, and then the middle part snaps onto the top of the printer's frame. It's easily detachable. The manual recommends a thorough recheck of all electrical connections, and then you can slap on the official label onto the frame right above the power supply unit and reward yourself with the final bunch of gummy bears. The pre-flight check is just a series of uh, mechanical checks before first applying power to the printer. One test just verifies that if the nozzle is lowered to the heat bed and then you move around on the X and Y axis that the nozzle doesn't lift above the heat bed or try to dig into it. And another test is to do a preliminary lowering of the super pinned uh, sensor uh, based on the thickness of a wire tie. Here are a couple overviews of the completed printer, front view and uh, from another angle. Also included with the kit is a power cord and I bought the second steel printing sheet. You also get one packet of isopropyl alcohol saturated wipes. You're going to need, need a lot more of them because every time you get ready for a new print you have to re-wipe the bed. I'd recommend getting a little uh, pump-up dispenser uh, for perfumes and things like that and put some isopropyl alcohol in it and get a uh, pack of lint-free non-scratch wipes that you can wet with the alcohol and wipe uh, I mean, you could buy a box full of the official Prusa ones or prepackaged uh, alcohol towelettes, but um, the way I suggest it is probably the least expensive. The printer also comes with a single acupuncture needle of the appropriate diameter to clean out the nozzle on the, uh, uh, the hot end where the molten filament comes out in case it ever gets clogged. You do have that tool handy. In order to transfer other files to the printer, you're probably going to want to buy, and I certainly did, a, uh, another inexpensive but yet good quality brand SD card. 
Uh, I didn't find anywhere in the manual where it recommended sizes. I went online and the advice from Prusa in various places, knowledge base and so on, was kind of confusing. I thought uh, it wasn't clear whether it was saying you could have sizes up to 32 gigabytes or if 32 was the lar was the uh, bottom end of the sizes that would not work. And I'd uh, gone into their 24-7 tech support and asked, and uh, I got one answer that said uh, you can use a 32 gig, but that's the largest. But since I wasn't convinced, I asked again with another chat and was told 32 and above will not work. <laughs> so I decided, well, the files aren't that huge. Uh, and I went to the local uh, Office Max where I usually buy my SD cards, and they happen to have some nice 16 gigabyte cards for about 12 bucks from SanDisk, so that's what I bought for mine. I forgot to mention that the printer also comes with a glue stick, which is mostly just used if you're trying to print with nylon because it doesn't want to stick to the print plate. Uh, it also comes with a little tube of lubricant, because eventually the lubricant in the linear bearings will need replenishment, and um, that's what it's for. And while the printer comes with um, a large roll of 1.75 PLA filament, uh, you're probably going to want to buy more, and the manual clarifies that the 1.75 millimeter filament is the only size that will work with this printer. That's all it's designed for. All right, first power up. We'll see what happens. Oh, isn't plugged in yet. Okay, so I'm going to say yes. It's going to check the assembly for the most common problems. I guess I have to push the button again. Please check the IR sensor connection unload filament if present. Insert the filament, do not load it, into the extruder and press the knob. Sensor verified, remove the filament. Now, I think all that's doing is checking the uh, sensor uh, that checks to see whether you have filament in it. So it's done that. Remove the filament. Now it's going to do the self-test. It's checking the one fan and it has a tachometer in it, and it checks to make sure that's working. Then it runs that fan. Okay, that says that's okay. Now it's checking the x-axis. That's the uh, metal top of the cabinet. I have this sitting on buzzing. Now it checks the y-axis. Now the z-axis. I saw the little light on the proximity sensor there. It's calibrating where home is. Okay, now it's checking 
to see if the bed heats up. I was watching Josef Prusa's video on doing this, but it's for the older model, and the sequence uh, of testing is a little different, and this model has more bells and whistles, so it checks additional things. So I just decided to revert to just following these instructions, since uh, watching his was confusing a little bit. It's definitely getting a little warm, so it's heating up. It's apparently using the thermistor to check that it's heating up at the rate expected. Okay, I like that. Now it's checking the actual hot end. That's the heater in the extruder. I'm not going to be able to touch that easily with my fingers. I don't know that it goes up to maximum temperature on these or if it's just looking for a rate of change. All correct. I will now run XYZ calibration. It will take approximately 12 minutes. Okay. here it's going to run both of them and if they're not absolutely level one of them will just stall. Yeah the right side was slightly low so it stalled the left side and raised the right and now they're together. Please clean the nozzle for calibration. Click when done. Uh, since it's a brand new nozzle I just checked uh, Prusa's um, video on doing this and he says if it's a brand new printer you don't really have to check anything just push the button because you know it's a new clean nozzle is the steel sheet on the heat bed yes it is and if I turn this to yes and push this it'll probably tell me please remove the sheet steel Okay, I did that. Place a sheet of paper under the nozzle during the calibration of the first four points. If the nozzle catches the paper during the calibration, power off the printer immediately. In his video he just says push the reset button, but either way. Okay, so I've got a piece of paper there. That's, I think, just to provide a hair gap and also to uh, make sure that the nozzle doesn't actually tear into the heat bed. So far it's not digging into it. Most of the noise here is coming from the small vibrations causing the sheet metal top of the cabinet. It's a file cabinet I have this sitting on and that's amplifying it. That's something I kind of feared that it could make this noisier than necessary. If that becomes a real problem, I may get something like a uh, nice sheet of quality plywood and put it on a yoga mat or some other 
you know, kind of foamy mat that'll uh, dampen the uh, transfer of vibrations. It's making very subtle time to time it bounces the y-axis carriage up and down a little bit. It's really hard to see but it is doing it. It's going up and down ever so slightly just like micro movements. See the uh, proximity sensor flashing as it comes in and out of. So I think part of what it's doing is just checking to see where the proximity sensor triggers. makes tiny little adjustments. You can see the dust cap on the uh, helical screw there showing that it is moving the uh, y-axis up and down slightly. It makes the um, y-axis move the bed forward ever so slightly every time it does a back and forth pass of the uh, x-axis. You can see it creeping forward in little jumps there. Should be nearing the end of 0.44 or 4 of 4. This takes several minutes per quadrant or zone or whatever we want to call them of the four of them. And uh, Prusa's video 
recommends that you stand here and hold the paper the whole time rather than just you know taping it down or something like that because if the uh, nozzle does catch into the bed due to something that the software can't deal with or a mechanical malfunction or something you did wrong in assembly you need to be able to catch it right away so you don't want to walk away and when you're holding the paper you can kind of feel if the uh, nozzle is starting to dig in because it's going to try to yank the paper loose from your fingers Okay, anytime I'm getting tired of standing here. Oops, okay. Place sheet steel or steel sheet on heat bed. Okay. Now there's these slanted notches on the back and those are supposed to use these two pins as a way of getting it centered. And of course the magnets in the heat bed hold the steel sheet down flat. Okay, I've done that. Measuring reference height of calibration point one of nine. X, Y, Z calibration okay. X and Y axis are perpendicular. Congratulations! Yay! Is filament loaded? No. Select nozzle preheat temperature which matches your material. Oh, it says nozzle temperature 205 to 220. Okay, so I'm going to assume it's in the 205-220 range. Apparently I have to turn the knob or push the button first. Okay, well, it's PLA, so it says 215. And then 60, these are degrees Celsius. And uh, the heat bed temperature, I think, is the second number. But I am using PLA. PLA, nozzle temperature between 205 and 220, heat bed between 40 and 60. So confirming PLA 215, it's in the middle of the range, 60 for the heat bed. I say okay. Okay, it says 215, 215. Self-test okay. It's 215 over 215 and 60 over 60. And uh, it did not ask me to um, so I'm not going to do anything else until I read more about this. I did uh, get one of my spare diagonal cutters. That I use for electronics uh, because when feeding the filament it's supposed to be at an angle not just a clean straight cut uh, and you definitely don't want some nonsense like this at the tip pardon me it looks like I've got leprosy I was doing some PVC pipe gluing earlier and got some of the cement on my hands it 
keeps peeling off. So with the side cutter, I can get a, uh, it's not really in focus, an angled tip like that. So I got to uh, first layer calibration. I have presumably loaded the filament. It's heating. It's going to check the nine points. Now it's adjusting the Z. Sheet smooth, one. So this is different than the video on the Prusa website. It's apparently something they've done different with the software. Trying it again, I pushed the filament down a little harder and now I got a little bit dribbling out the nozzle. So maybe it'll work this time. Didn't know there was an LED back there. Doing the nine point test. Now it's laying a bead down, but um, I'm supposed to be able to go to a minus number and look at the quality of what it's laying down. I didn't video it. I thought I was, but it didn't. This is the uh, what they call the first layer calibration, uh, where it feeds the filament, melts it, and I spin the knob here and watch the readout and watch as it prints this little rectangle. And the goal is to get it to print a evenly flat bead that leaves no gaps between the alternate uh, back and forth passes. So you can see the texture there, but um, if I go up to the light, you know, the gaps are not really that profound. Um, so I think that's probably a good setting to try printing something for real. Okay, with the presumably uh, appropriate settings on the first layer test. I'm going to try to actually print something. And uh, with the SD card that comes with this printer, I'm going to insert it into the slot on the left side. It's sorting the files. Immediately it has a Prusa test pattern. Uh, whistle, it makes a whistle, Batman, 3D Hubs, Buddy, 3D Benchy, that's a benchmark. I think I'm going to select that one. So it's uh, 
doing the heating. I could have preheated this first while I was searching through the files and it would have gone faster. But the software knows enough to do it if I skip that step. So again the top figure is the extruder temperature and the bottom figure is the heat bed or hot bed. I have cleaned my steel print surface or print bed with isopropyl alcohol. Um, I'm just using the settings that uh, are built into this file. I could change them. I think that 100% is the uh, scale. You could scale it up or down. <coughs> And the Z axis there, I think all that's telling me is that the uh, extruder is currently setting at a, a vertical dimension of, of 10, whatever the units are. So the extruder is almost up to temperature. The heat bed is lagging a little bit, but it's catching up. The extruder goes a little bit over. I hear the quiet little fan running. And it's dropping the extruder temperature a little bit. I can feel the heat radiating off the bed. Hopefully it'll get going here in a moment. making a little puddle. It's going to do its nine point level check. Now it's going to print that line, that bead, that is supposed to um, allow it to just equalize pressure in the extruder. It's printing a little boat shape. Unfortunately, the boat is so small that it's mostly covered up by the uh, print head, by the extruder head. see what's going on. <laughs> I should have printed a lot bigger.
don't know what the 2% means, that that's 2% printed. Well, it does appear to be building something up there, so I guess all is well. <clears throat> but other than occasional glimpses of it, I'll have to come back and watch this after it's built it up a little higher. When it's making all that noise and doing the jittering, that's when it's doing the infill, which is just sort of a zigzaggy pattern um, on places that are internal to a larger mass. Uh, rather than filling it with solid plastic, it does a uh, sort of a lattice work that's partially open air and partially the lattice of the plastic. And when you're doing the slicing, apparently, you can uh, dictate, come on camera, focus. You can dictate how much infill there is. Some places you might not want to have infill at all. Some places you really want to save on plastic or make the part lighter or whatever and uh, you decide to go the other direction. But it does appear to be building up something there, so, so far all looks good. I'm at 7%, just sitting back here in my office chair, giving my back a break. So since everything seems to be going well, I'm going to just check up on this every few minutes. see some of the infill down there. And uh, I believe it's the slicer program that determines the shape of the infill lattice. Some of them just like to make a simple grid, others make kind of a wavy pattern. And. Um, it seems like the ones they bundle with the Prusa tend to do a more artistic looking infill. Twenty percent done according to the display. Temperatures are right on the money. Looks like maybe it's starting to print the deck up far enough in it that it has to do something besides infill. gunwale, but that's probably totally the wrong word. 
I don't know my nautical terminology, the railing basically that goes around the sides and rear. It all looks well so far, it looks pretty clean. I don't see it being really rough or anything. Okay, about, um, I don't know what it is, maybe 20 minutes later. <laughs> We're up to 36% uh, of the print, and the boat seems to be taking shape nicely. I think there will be a lot less time spent doing infill once we get up into the superstructure because it, I think it's mostly just walls and panels. that we don't have any action or very little action on the uh, vertical axis um, because mostly it's just printing one layer at a time but it does have to when it makes sudden changes in the uh, X and Y then it has to change the uh, Z axis uh, otherwise it drags the tip over other work so it sometimes has to lift it just like you'd lift a a pen when you're moving from one character to another when you're writing. And all this I'm saying here is just observational. I've never owned or operated a 3D printer before. This is my uh, indoctrination uh, into this. and um, So it's a combination of what I've been observing and what I've heard and read. but things seem to be going very well. I was a little worried when I had difficulty with the first layer calibration. And that was mostly due to uh, disparity between the way the photos looked in the manual and the website, the uh, description given by Josef Prusa on his Getting Started video, and differences between the models you know, this is a fairly new model, and um, everything, or the majority of things I was finding online are referencing the older model, which mostly deals with differences in the software. And so um, I wasn't doing it quite right, and I had to use their 24-7 uh, live chat, which helped me get through that step, and that uh, does seem to have made the difference. Well, about an hour after starting the print, we're at the 51% mark, and uh, I have to make sure I don't inadvertently get my camera or my finger in the way of the uh, y-axis and the, the hotbed. I don't want to cause this to crash halfway through the print. But so far the print looks very clean. I'm very pleased for a first time out of the uh, gate that it's looking as good as it does. It seems pretty crisp. Well, my camera would focus anyway. Oh yeah, lots of detail on it. We do seem to be at the point where there's not a whole lot of infill. A little bit up right in the bow. Mostly it's just making walls and things at this point. I'm surprised that it thinks it's only halfway done because it seemed like the bulk of the printing has taken place already. 
after about another 18 minutes. air compressor kicking on downstairs from where I'm at here. There are some uh, red lights flickering inside the controller or the um, Einsi board. I don't know what they mean. I guess they're just communications are happening kind of lights and of course occasionally we get a red LED on the power connector for the bed heating turns on and off as uh, it needs to So this fan on the side, um, I think it sucks air in that way and blows it out this way past the veins on the heated extruder element, and maybe it's drawing it the other way. And this one here supposedly sucks air in and then directs it down through a ducting and right onto the um, right out the bottom where the uh, extruder tip is. And my understanding is the objective of that is to immediately cool off the area that's just been printed so it doesn't stay molten longer than necessary. So one prevents overheating of the heating element or helps regulate its temperature because the, the heater heats it up and the fan helps cool it and between the two of them they keep it at the desired temperature. And this one here is just for uh, making sure that you don't keep the molten filament molten for any longer than necessary. Doing so would make it the uh, results saggy and less distinct and sloppier. The things still look good. It just completed a um, 
a maneuver that is one of the uh, indicators built into this particular design. And I, I think I mentioned already that this file is called Benchy. A cute name for a little boat, but also um, because it's a benchmark. It's supposedly either designed to be a benchmark or it just incorporates enough characteristics that it makes it a good benchmark. I don't know which, but it's a common first file to print on a 3D printer to see how well it's working and uh, check its performance. And uh, so far it looks very good, but anyway, the reason I mention that is it's been making these anchor holes and of course it has to print over empty space when it does that. But it seems to have uh, done a nice neat job of it on both anchor holes. I'm thinking that that percentage done next to the word SD probably isn't intended to be um, time percentage, although it may end up being that. It may just be strictly um, how many layers it's worked through. It may have, it may be 68 percent of the way from the bottom layer to the topmost layer. Not really sure how that number is calculated. But it's now about uh, an hour and 25 minutes thereabouts since I started printing this. Okay, we're getting towards the top of the superstructure here. It should be starting to arch over the, the doorways and windows. Yeah, it is starting to arch them over. Just prints a little bit further out on each pass, and if it's not too much of an overhang, then it can do it. This is a good place where you can tell if it's not cooling the extruded filament quickly enough, then it would sag there and you'd get a rougher surface. 82%, an hour and 43 minutes into it, and it has arched over at least the uh, side doorways in the rear window, it looks like. Hasn't done the uh, front yet, but it's got to be ready to start on the roof. have about 12 minutes to go to get to two hours. I don't know that it's going to take quite that long, but we'll see. Looks 
once it gets starting to work on the roof. about seven minutes to go if we're assuming two hours is going to do it and it's kind of hard to see but uh, I can get glimpses there of uh, how it has roofed over the uh, cabin now it's just building up the uh, the thickness of the of the roof and I think it has some tiling that it's probably doing as well and then it has to make a little chimney that'll probably go very quickly because it has such a small cross section It might be doing a little bit of infill there. Yeah, it is. There's enough thickness to the roof that it it's doing infill. Unfortunately, I can't fo zoom in any more than this without losing focus. I think because there's a bit of a slope to the roof, it's already uh, skinning over the rear part of the roof, but it's still doing infill at the front part of the roof. Now it looks like it's probably skinning in the front part as well, or skimming, o skinning over, I should have said. does this maneuver just going back and forth I think that's where it's starting to build the, um, the crosswise roof board uh, texture that'd be my guess but I can't see it clearly yeah you can see where it has done it in the rear it's supposed to look like boards going crosswise but it's still filling in at the front so it's not ready for the texture yet. As the beginnings of the chimney formed, it adds another layer to that. But it's pretty uh, thin walled there, so looks like it only takes a couple of uh, parallel passes to, to add a layer to that part. Still has to fill in the um, a bit of skinning over at the front of the roof. 94%.
Looks like the roof has got to be nearly done there. Six percent. It's now just a couple minutes shy of two hours into the print. It should be focusing on the chimney exclusively here right about now. It seems like it is because it's not going back to the front of the roof. minutes later and it's starting to form the, uh, the top of the chimney ninety eight percent it's into ninety nine percent in seven minutes. There's a little fiber left over when it pulled away but not bad. I'm going to wait for the bed to cool off a little bit. It is not telling the uh, the extruder or the bed to be hot at this time. So it's letting the temperature decay naturally. I'll just give it a couple minutes. Okay, will it just pop off of here? Yes it did. And it has some text on the bottom. CT3D XYZ. Which is why it was using that strange pattern when it first started printing. I thought it, it's odd that it wasn't going for a smooth bottom and wondered if they might be doing some text on it. The little uh, steering wheel in there seems to have come out well formed. There's a couple little spider webs on here but that always happens. I might want to do a small adjustment with the um, Z axis to try to get that to fill a little smoother, but it's certainly not bad. There's a little bit of uh, hang on the top of that window. still can't quite make out what that says, but it is text. I looked at it through my jeweler's loop. It is clearly text, not just some aberration in the printing. It's just um, 
not quite clear enough to make it out. I can't read all the letters. It looks like the last letters might be Boaty or something like that. Um, but, I don't know. Success! The Prusa works. Yeah, I've been uh, cheating a little bit and eating a bit more of the uh, gummy bears as I than I should have been during the uh, process of building and testing this printer. So I only have three left to celebrate the uh, commissioning of the printer with that print of the uh, Benchy boat. <laughs>